This is the Roaring Elephant podcast for the 17th of September 2019. And it's a news episode, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Dave. How you been, Dave? I've been very well. And yourself? Uh, very busy, but that's a good thing, I guess. Summer's over, it so is. hard work starts it, again. <laughs> yeah, well, it's much better than the alternative. So, uh, <laughs> with um, that, as you say, it's news. Yeah, but you've been slagging um, your YouTube announcements in the last episode. I'm not sure if you want to do some... Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe we're at, we're at 100 now. <laughs> Who knows, due to the space-time <laughs> continuum. But if we aren't... You can pause this podcast, you can go to your phone or to your web browser, you can go to YouTube, you can search for Roaring Elephant Podcast, find the podcast, subscribe, and I promise when we get to 100, I'll stop doing that at almost every single episode. Come on, promise. that should be reason enough to, to do it, maybe people come up do it. Promise. <laughs> anyway, anyway, on with the news. Yes, lots of news. We, uh, we, the first article, we, we sort of talked a little bit about, uh, so this is a little bit meta because we're talking about articles about a Gartner survey. <laughs> so, um, we, we were perhaps a little bit harsh on an article on this topic, uh, a few episodes ago. And I wish we, I wish we'd found, or wish I'd found rather this article instead, um, so it's an article on the Enterprise Project, Enterprises Project, sorry, dot com, mm. written by uh, Kevin Casey, and it is a far better article than our previous uh, previous view on this. Um, it actually does cover a lot of the uh, things that we had complaints about on the previous article. So, for example, uh, they just, define they said that it's an article on multi cloud. I don't think you mentioned that. I was just I was just about to. They define multi-cloud as um, using two or more cloud services from two or more vendors. Um, so they they actually just go out and, and state that as a fact. Um, they then sort of break it down into um, a few different uh, a few different sections. So the first one is uh, multi-cloud becoming uh, becomes a more intentional strategy. And I think again, this is this is the sort of thing that we were we were talking about. You know, the, there's a comment towards the bottom about for a long time people were just wrestling with the cloud, which I think is very much sort of how things were. People were just trying to work out how this cloud thing works, how it impacts them, how they can use it, um, and that now that people are getting more comfortable with that, I wouldn't say that we've got there yet. Um, but I think people are in more of a state of understanding what it can do for them, how to use it, how to best utilize it, um, and, and that side of things. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. For, for the longest time, going to cloud meant a lift and shift, just uh, spin, spin up a bunch of VMs on, on somebody else's data center and do exactly yeah. what I'm doing in my own data center and hoping it's going to solve all my problems. Which yeah, of course, which of didn't. course, was the yeah, which was the worst <laughs> idea ever. Lift and shift, yeah. just but terrible. Yeah. Sometimes it wasn't necessary because there were I don't know the lease on the data center ended, so they needed to move now. Yeah, but it should never yeah. be a goal at, at the end goal. It should be okay. We'll yeah. do the lift and shift and immediately start retooling stuff towards the multi cloud environment. So not multi cloud necessarily, but the cloud native environments. But if you can yep. do it uh, before you do that and just have your data center running and then just pick up the uh, the applications, the use cases, and move them in a cloud native way to a cloud environment, that's when you're actually starting to use cloud and you're not just renting a more expensive data center. Indeed. And in fact, the goes up that links seamlessly to the the second point mm -hmm. which is the cloud native technology stack grows up which i think we've also seen you know things like containers and kubernetes significantly more mature yeah exactly significantly more mature than they were only a couple of years ago um and i think you have a you have a favorite quote here that i, I won't steal from you i think you should <laughs> uh, you should own it yeah that's the one i'm going to remember this one and reuse it so um uh forget the name of the author here. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much for this one, but this is just pure gold. Ultimately, multi-cloud is not an infrastructure strategy. Multi-cloud is an application strategy and a business strategy. It's a means to an end. And that's actually a quote from a other person. Uh, see, Reddy from Salaza Reddy. 
Sazala, really, excuse me, CTO and founder of Datrium. And that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've, I've never, I've always thought it, of it that way, but I never was able to articulate it this, this clearly. Because a lot mm-hmm. of people think multi-cloud should be infrastructure. It's a disaster recovery strategy. It's uh, I need to have two data centers, two servers for everything with a balancing and active passive and stuff like that. And while that may be something you do, you should really look at the application layer, the higher level uh, abstraction layers you're, you're deploying here. And that's where the multi-cloud can shine. And that's also what you said when we discussed the other article last time, where yeah. you should look at what's running well on which cloud and make use of the things that work best where they work best and just connect that all up yeah yeah definitely um so the third point is um cloud connectivity becomes critical Mm. and it it starts off with a uh another sentiment i i thoroughly agree with which is that by most definitions many organizations went multi-cloud in quotes almost by accident which is (laughs) which i think is absolutely the case a lot of organizations were consuming a variety of different quote-unquote best-of-breed services that just happen to be on different clouds or have different services on the back end or whatever they might be and then it's all very well sort of going best of breed you know this and best of breed that but at some point usually there's some sort of integration needed or required and of course, that's when things start to get a little bit stickier and a little bit more awkward. Um, but I think this is um, this is another really interesting point mm-hmm. where just containerization and uh, cloud native technologies sort of improve some things. You know, they should improve portability, for example, um, and your ability to potentially migrate stacks from one environment to another. But it's it's not a it's not an all-consuming answer. There's still a lot of things that you're going to need to look at um, when you go you go down this multi-cloud uh, direction. Yeah, for me, it's more of um, looking at the level of cloud adoption you're doing because you have the, mm-hmm. the IaaS, the PaaS, and the SaaS, the infrastructure as a service, mm-hmm. platform as a service, and, and I was going to say service as a service, but software as a service. <laughs> <laughs> and... For me, being becoming multi-cloud by accident is not necessarily a bad thing if you're no, totally on no. that SaaS layer. If you're just taking off, I don't know, your email from here and your uh, CRM from there and whatever, you don't care what cloud is running on. You're not doing anything. You, you're not actually a cloud user there per se. You're just a service solution software user. And mm-hmm. if that means you're on different clouds, then... Who cares? If it works, it works. It's great. But the more deep you go, the, the further down you go from PaaS to EaaS, yeah, that's where you, if you start spinning up your own uh, Docker environment or just your VMs and put stuff on there, that's where the connectivity becomes critical. And I think last time also we discussed the fact that uh, things like data replication, synchronization, those are things that really, really um, can be a headache. And you then countered very correctly that uh, every big cloud out there these these days has a Docker service available, mm-hmm. which makes those things on the application level easier. On the data level, I think we're still getting there. Yeah, very much so. Um, which, again, kind of leads us fairly nicely onto the fourth point here. IT teams prioritize operational consistency. And this is uh, particularly uh, nicely aligned to some of the conversations we were having with Mark on the previous episode and the next episode. (laughs) Um, You know, managing services consistently regardless of the underlying legacy and multi-cloud application infrastructure or platforms. You can only do that with, with proper automation and orchestration. Can you imagine just trying to do all of that manually? You'd, you'd be insane. Now, again, for me, if you're staying on the SaaS level, you're kind of farming that out to whoever the SaaS uh, vendor mm-hmm. is. But the moment you go past an EAS, cloud should always be companion, accompanied with uh, DevOps and, if possible, continuous integration, continuous uh, um, deployment. deployment. Thank you. Because, mm-hmm. because you kind of lose control when you go to a cloud. They will change things and sometimes surprise you by what they're doing and if you then have to do a lot of manual stuff all around that's gonna really hurt you if you're gonna do the lift and shift and then go cloud native it's harder but if you're gonna go cloud native from the start 
part of going cloud native, in my opinion, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is doing good DevOps, good data ops if you're doing data stuff, doing CI, CD, mm-hmm. make sure that that's all, that that framework is all built. And then you kind of, uh, yeah, don't fall into this trap, I guess. I hope. Yeah, very much so. And then the fifth and final point, which actually, for an article that is so strong elsewhere, I think this is one that I find a little bit on the weaker side. And this is uh, (laughs) machine learning and multi-cloud will grow together. Um, The point here really seems to be that a lot of the technologies that people tend to adopt when going into multi-cloud, like, you know, serverless workloads and ephemeral workloads, um, generate uh, significantly more data than you know the tradi- a lot of the traditional services. So what are you going to do with all this data? And if you don't have a an efficient way of ingesting it, then it's not clear as to where you would ingest it or what you would do with it. I, this to me feels like a little bit of a red herring. I'm I'm not convinced that just because data is being generated. Um, you know what's the what's the business case for you to actually use that data? So, I I don't know what your thoughts are on this this fifth point. It's it's a maybe for me. It's a it's a soft maybe. It's not even a hard maybe. <laughs> what do you think? What's um, your view? Uh, there's definitely some so a little bit of AI washing uh, going on here. Make it mm-hmm. get some more hits on this. But I do <laughs> think it also makes sense if you're not looking at big data as the standard big data thing, but looking at how in a heterogeneous environment across multiple clouds and all these microservices are popping up and down and changing things or whatever and doing rolling updates and have half of your Docker environment or your Kubernetes environment running version one and the other one version two into keeping a finger on all that at the moment is a big headache for a lot of IT departments because they got mm-hmm. alerts and monitoring and uh, pop-ups coming up all over the place, which they just click away because, yeah, I know I'm upgrading. Shut up. <laughs> and what's happening these days with a lot of companies out there that, that do infrastructure monitoring and alerting is that they add machine learning rules uh, to their solutions to make that easier. So if you look at them this point, yeah, I can see how... Uh, if you're doing all of this stuff, you need to make sure you monitor it. You need to make sure that it's available, quality is good, that it's just there. And if it falls over, that at least you know where you have to look as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. And with these uh, kind of complex environments, yeah, machine learning does help. I've seen environments where that can really change things and really be good. And that's also why you see a lot of solutions uh, being added to Kubernetes to do that monitoring, that event gathering and machine learning all in one go to give you that uh, ease of use and a little less false positives, I guess. But that's my reading, if I'm very, how do you call that, uh, benevolent of uh, 0.5? Yeah, let's go, let's go with that. Let's go with that. But uh, hey, it's he says big day. He didn't mention blockchain, so you have to credit, give him credit for that. <laughs> but you just did. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's no escaping it. My God. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, moving on from one buzzword to the next. Uh, our next article: Why doesn't anyone weep for Docker? Um, so this this I find quite an interesting article. I don't have. Um, I certainly don't have any real axe to grind here, mm-hmm. and I'm uh, there's a number of people you know that I've uh, worked with relatively closely in the past have uh, recently joined Docker, and I'm still not quite sure that I understand why. And this this article goes into it's a little bit of a um, sort of historical. Uh, digging around of uh, what the what the situation was around Docker, and in fact, Jan and I had a quick discussion even before we recorded this as to what we were going to say about it. And I'm still honestly not quite sure, apart from the fact that the article does ask a number of people, you know, what their opinions are or were on, you know, why Docker as a company failed to be as successful as perhaps it should have been given the wide adoption of its underlying technologies. Um, 
you know, Jan made a, a good point when we were talking before the show about the fact that really some of it was just that they didn't really seem to have a good handle on their go-to-market strategy when they when they initially started uh, started up. And I think, to me, that still very much feels like the case today. Um, and I, I can only guess or speculate that some of the reason that... Uh, some folks that I've worked with before have have gone there. Is that you know they're aiming to make changes to that and and come up with a, a new model that uh, that does make more sense. But it's there's there's some things in this article that I think are perhaps more um, inflammatory than others. But I think one one that you can take away as a general takeaway is that um, when when you're looking um, at developing something new in this in this in in the tech industry as a, as an overall goal, um, you really don't want to start out as the uh, the organisation that thinks they know everything, um, doesn't need anybody else, is better than everybody else. And there's a there's a quote from. Um, Adam Jacobs, who sort of really says that from the outside, Docker made no friends at all in the industry. My experience was they were convinced they needed nobody better than everybody, and it was essentially fate. Turns out you need friends when the industry turns. And I, I'm i not sure that I... Well, I don't know if that was the case or not. I, I don't have any of the background here, but I think it's, it is really interesting that um, in many cases... You just you need to have that frenemy or uh, co-opetition sort of uh, thing going on. Many organisations, you know, do deals with people that and organisations that you know you would think would be their natural enemies, just because you know there's no there's no one technology that's going to rule them all. In the majority of cases, there's going to be multiple technologies that people are going to consume. So, you know, whether it's partnerships or um, joint marketing or whatever it might be, very rarely do organizations just go all out. No, we're the only thing you'll ever need. You'll never need anybody else. Just do everything with us. And uh, I don't know that was the case with Docker. I say I don't don't have the the depth of visibility into this, but I do think that that is something that uh, we've no doubt seen before, and I'm sure we'll see again. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering if this is maybe a problem of that era because Docker is uh, from 2013. I just looked it up on uh, everybody's favorite Wikipedia, Hooray. and that was a time, if memory serves, where open source was really booming and had all old really cool things started and they you had to kind of feel better than the rest to be crazy enough to do something like that i guess i don't know and i was i was kind of when you were talking there i was kind of wondering how would docker look like if it would happen start today mm. if we were just in current environments because uh, of course, if Docker hadn't started then, we, they wouldn't have them as an example, but there have been other uh, open source projects and uh, Spark kind of came to mind at a certain point as well, where yeah. the the internal attitude drove away the community. And in the case of Spark, they were able to turn that around mostly, I think, because yeah. uh, Spark really yeah. good going guys. It's been a while since we had any blogs on any, any of your blogs on our news show, shows, but that's not by choice. It's just because apparently have not anything interesting at the moment. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it's just those days. Because even if you don't look at open source, but just I mean, I work in sales. I'm a solution architect, so I am part of a sales organization there. The way you do sales and technology has also changed from no longer being competit- competitive. Of, yeah, you're always competitive against it is sales, but you never go to a customer now and say, A and B is bad, we're good. No, mm. you're looking at, okay, using A and B, why? Okay, what are the pain points? How can we assist you to make that better? How can we help you? And yep. that's just a time geist, a tight geist that's kind of changed. I don't know, maybe I'm being too rose-colored glasses here, uh, rose-colored glasses here but... Um, Maybe that's a bit of it as well, that they were at a time where this was considered normal. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I think I would argue that like that whole solution selling approach has been around for a long time. Now, maybe they were very much outside of that. I don't know. But uh, mm. it's 
Yeah, it's just curious. And I I do wonder, you know, what's next for um for Docker and uh, what their what their what their next direction change is going to be because I would I would certainly strongly argue that uh, I don't think they can carry on going the way they're going at the moment. Yeah, but my question is, and that's when I when you sent me the, uh, the link for the article, I read the, the title, uh, Who Weeps for Docker, I thought, oh, did, did the project go away? Is it gone? And I felt, <laughs> whatever. Because <laughs> I don't use Docker. I use Kubernetes. Mm. I use microservices. And yes, that uses Docker underneath. But for me, it it's more like a library that I use. If I'm doing a web application, I'm using, I don't know, Django or React or whatever, a kind of a framework thing. It's not really a solution. It's not a product the way that Docker Swarm used to be. And Docker Swarm, correct me if I'm wrong, that got cobbled up by Kubernetes, right? Well, I mean, it, no, it didn't. It just vanished quietly into the sunset. Yeah, I think but, it was put to death. But the rhetoric was that somewhere. Kubernetes became yeah. API compliant and you could just do a lift and shift. <laughs> so yeah, for me, will anybody be for Docker? I don't think so, because Docker will never go away. And then I don't mean the Docker uh, files on GitHub, but the Docker concept, the container concept. And if you think about, about it that way, then Docker wasn't the first one doing this. Containers and Linux have been around since the beginnings of BSD. We're talking the 70s mm-hmm. here. <laughs> Yep. So, Indeed. well, I mean, you can go go all the way back, way before that, and start talking mainframe if you like. But, uh, uh, no, 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 no. We're a big tech uh, podcast. We do not talk about yeah, mainframes. No. Big tech. It, they're huge. <laughs> Have you seen the mainframe? <laughs> no, and I'm keeping it that way. <laughs> Sorry, right. just joking. Mainframes are great. If they solve your problem, do your mainframe thing. Just don't call me. Hey, they will outlive all of us. Definitely. Um, anyway, moving on is. An awesome article from Monzo, from the Monzo blog. And this was uh, an article about an outage they had on the 29th of July. And you might think, oh, surely it's just one of these. We had a service outage. It's all fixed now. Just like the, uh, the patch updates on your mobile phone update that just say functionality and performance improvements <laughs> along with security <laughs> updates. Oh, God, I hate that. Anyway, um, but no, no, this article goes into a, a really impressive um, amount of, of depth. And in fact, I don't know if... Yes, yeah, so the, the article does have an author, Chris Evans, uh, platform team lead at, uh, at Monzo. And uh, I mean, Jon, you found this article, so do you want to have a have a... A shuffle through it and pick out your favorite pieces well i mean the first thing i really like here is that the openness they demonstrate here i mean monzo is a finance related app and it's almost an unseen i would say i was going to say unheard because we're a podcast but we're doing youtube as well uh, uh, it's also unheard <laughs> to see this kind of uh, openness and sharing of uh, lessons learned and how they're going to solve their problems in the future or hope to solve the problems in the future and everything so mm-hmm. really really like this and uh I forget you said the name Chris Evans thank you so much for doing this because this can really help people avoid these same mistakes um, I'm not going to go through the whole article because it's, it is rather lengthy as you said it does really go into some depth here but basically it was about the NoSQL environment they needed to scale it bigger because they were reaching limits of the thing so things went kind of wrong there and uh, the first thing I want to call out and we in our pre-discussion, you already told me I was totally wrong there, so I hope we can have the same discussion again with the uh, audience mm-hmm. listening in. Um, 13.10, the first timestamp, we start scaling Cassandra. No problem there. But then we have a flag set, which we believe means then whatever comes after doesn't really matter, because which we believe means... <laughs> <laughs> that is so big a trap these days. And the thing I said that totally enraged Dave, and he's probably going to go over it on the tantrum when I say it again. For me, mm-hmm. this is one of the things that we careful for with open source environment, open source software and open source environments, because the things in open source change so much. It's so easy to just think you know what you're doing because, yeah, it's the same thing like that thing. And I know what that thing does. It sounds the same. It's probably going to be that. And it's it's so dangerous to do this. You really have to make sure you educate yourself on anything you do in open source, even more so perhaps than when you do it in closed source. 
And this is where I <laughs> sort of said, well, not sure I agree with that because honestly, I, I think this is less a question of open source versus closed source. And I think it's more a question of the industry as a whole and and how fast the industry is moving and the fact that, yes, documentation is A, probably uh, not the greatest that it's ever been. And also the majority of people don't feel they have the time to read the documentation in the first place anyway. And so I, I've seen people using proprietary systems that have also made this same exact kind of mistake. Oh, I thought I knew what that option was that I added to the file system when we restarted it. What do you mean it's got into a, a full, um, you know, a, a full checking instead of booting the machine up, oh no, oh no, oh no, the cluster's down. So I've I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of these kind of cock ups happen over the years and it's not it's not been something specific or endemic to open source, I don't think. I think it is certainly something that we see a lot in our industry and I think we need to hold hold ourselves responsible to make sure that you're not making assumptions when you make changes, especially um, changes of this kind of um, this scale of magnitude. When you're you know making significant changes to the architecture of a cluster, you owe it to yourself and to your colleagues and to whoever's on call to kind of absolutely <laughs> verify that you know you really you really have made the changes that you think you're making. And it's unless you know the configuration options off by heart and there hasn't been a, a recent mm-hmm. release of it that may have changed those configuration options. Um there if if it's if it's a script that you run all day, every day, 15 times a day, then great, that's fine. But this is not that kind of thing. This is the, oh, you know, we're doing this thing that we last did a few months ago or lasted several years ago or whatever it might be um and i don't really know what that flag is but it's in the script so surely it's fine or it's in it's in the command or whatever it's in the run book or whatever so surely it's fine you know do do yourself some uh, uh do yourself a favor go and actually check to see what that uh, that flag that variable that uh, that particular sort of option actually does. And you know what? It might be absolutely fine. It might do absolutely what you thought it does. Um, but what if it doesn't? What if someone else has, you know, accidentally put the wrong flag into their documentation, copied the, the wrong command line into the run book? And uh, here are hatred for run books uh, on either the previous episode or the following episode. <laughs> but uh, it's it's just... I think it is not. It's not something specific to open source, in my personal view. I think it's something that uh, we all need to improve on. Excellent. I was going to go back to that one, <laughs> but <laughs> run over. <laughs> but uh, even uh, following on the assumption theme here, uh, another the second thing that I noticed that that for me was important in this article, and they actually don't pick up on, I think, is at a number of points during their diagnosis of what was going wrong. Because basically, when they did this upgrade, things started failing all over the place, and at a mm. number of points there, I can remember three at, uh, at the top of my head. They kind of said. Yeah, it can't be the database update because we know that is good. And I don't really understand because if in, in my experience, when I do something and things start breaking, I will spend like five minutes looking at possible other usual suspects and then think, mm-hmm. okay, even though I think what I did, it was good, I'm going to do a rollback here because this is the thing that changed. It's really likely that that's the problem. And at the moment, the thing I changed isn't doing anything anyway, so I can just roll that back now and see if it's solved it. And then at my yeah. leisure, start figuring out what went wrong. And that, I mean, the whole timeline, they, they had a couple of times, we, we thought again about the, the database upgrade, but nah, it looked fine and we knew it was good. And it just moved into different directions. Although, to be fair, to be fair to them, and this is something else that I, I, I think we see far far too often and perhaps don't admit enough, when something goes wrong, it does cause people to investigate, you know, the code, the paths, the what's going on, you know, debugging things in more depth than they would normally do. And I don't know about you, but it, it really does 
disturb and surprise me how often that exercise turns out that you know they, they uncover more you know uh, bugs configuration things that aren't set correctly sure. you know things that actually were broken that they hadn't realized were broken or were broken to such a small degree that it was it was causing them a problem but not so much that they really bothered mm-hmm. about it and it it's these kind of incidents that cause them to go and fix those things because they think oh that's finally got to be such a big problem we better go and fix it and but it, it's it's a lot of this uh it, it ends up just being a sort of uh, red herring uh, yeah. a false lead so yeah, it's, I find that kind of interesting as well. And I find that, that, that that's happening and that there is a forensic evidence happening, a forensic investigation happening after the fact. But first, restore your normal operation and then yeah, spend sure. the time but looking th- at it. That's what they thought they were doing there, isn't it, right? That's the yeah, whole but thing. But. A rollback <laughs> is such a simple thing to do if you've done your preparation. Because rollbacks are just like backups. Everybody tests their backups so they know they're good, right? Wrong. Of course test your restores. Do. Don't test your backups. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with these kind of things. When you change software, don't check that the changes work. Check that you can roll them back in a quick fashion, especially on a production system. And especially on a system that's yeah. actually real-time live. People are using this right now and can't live without that situation. I mean, I hope they're not making pacemakers. Uh, although pacemakers are also pretty crappy, if I understand. That. But let's not go there. <laughs> anyway... Uh, look, following on on your uh, uh, talking about uh, looking at things that were maybe done wrong in the past, another thing that popped out here, which is very nicely in line with our discussion with Mark, the two in the two interviews episodes, one you just had and one that's coming next week, is they also had a case of we changed something in October 2018 and we set a setting somewhere and now it came back to bite us in the behind. And that's, yeah, we, we talked to the market uh, on that subject as well, that doing things in configuration management in a DevOps way will kind of, uh, it will never avoid things completely, but it will allow you to at least n- see when it happened, what changed, and be able to roll it back again, perhaps. But uh, yeah, making manual changes because it's simple. I'll just do it in production and now it works. Mm. Be careful on that one. Something else I'd like to I'd like to mention is yes. that if you uh, if you go and take a look at the comments of, mm. against this particular article, uh, there are something like 60, 60 plus comments I think, um, and overall they are incredibly um, positive and. The sort of there's a range of people going from, you know, very technical people to people that said, I was just about to follow, I, I was, you know, it was a bit too technical for me, but I was just about able to follow it. And it, you know, I really appreciate the the information. And uh, I think this is a, a great article, a great article. It's brought together a great collection of, of, of thoughts and comments. And it probably is a moderated forum, I'm sure. But I just uh, it gives me it gives me hope for humanity. I think <laughs> that uh, there's such a lot of really sort of uh, really positive and really constructive feedback here. Yeah, I mean, it it just shows you that if you're honest about these things and open about them, even without spilling the beans, you don't have to sell out and show everything. But just being open about what the problem was, how it was, people really don't mind that you fail unless you fail over and over and over and over again. But everybody makes mistakes. And by doing this, you you create so much goodwill. You get so much advantages out of it. It's really it can only be a positive ending there. But anyway, uh, I do want to go back to the article because uh, the, the, one of the best things in the article is the fact that at the end they actually tell us to stop this happening again. We're making some changes, and they're mm-hmm. telling us how they're gonna well hopefully avoid these things happening in the uh, in the future. And yeah, number one here, very important, of course, we've identified gaps in the knowledge of operating this uh, NoSQL database, this Cassandra environment. Yeah, well, we talked about that one already, just education is very important, especially for open source. (laughs) (laughs) Someone slap that, man. Uh, 
considered my, my slapped, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the second one is very, also, also a nice one. We tested the scale upon our test environment, but not to the same extent as production. And that's actually one I want to spend some time on because I've seen this so much in IoT environments, but apparently mm-hmm. even in simple, quote, quote, uh, air quotes, environments, this is also valid. Make sure your testing environment, you, you should have multiple testing environments. You should have a testing environment that just checks, does script run on new stuff? Great. Mm-hmm. Next test environment, the script run on same scale environment. And we've talked about cloud uh, in earlier articles already. Cloud makes this so easy. You don't have to have a full duplicate of your production environment doing nothing while you're not uh, changing or or, or releasing your stuff. You can just remove it from the cloud environment. And when you do have a new release coming up or do want to test something at scale, spend, I don't know, a hundred bucks spin up a couple of VM instances and do this at a reasonable scale. Because in this case, they just tested on adding, by adding one server to the um, to the cluster and they got bitten by the fact that the cluster was working with uh, three server quorum settings. So as long as they didn't add three, adding the one server didn't really change anything. In the, in the real upgrade, they added nine. Hey! Yep, six even. But yes, oh, sorry. it's... A multiple it's of one, <laughs> indeed. It's one of those. It's one of those things where if you're looking at uh, test environments, it needs to it doesn't need to be a carbon copy of production, but it needs to be representative. Exactly. You know, if, if you know, something you know, ten or twenty percent or thirty percent of the scale of production that you can spin up at a moment's notice and then spin down when you're done with it, you know, something along those kind of lines, depending on the, the scale that you're operating. If, obviously, if you've got hundreds of thousands of instances, then 10% is probably a little bit overkill. But yeah, exactly. yeah, I think you I think you get, uh, you get where I'm heading with it. Yeah, I was going to say, it's more a factor of, is it affordable, practical? Because if, in this case, it's, uh, the total service environment was like uh, a dozen nodes... It's not a problem to spin up a dozen nodes in a cloud, Mm -hmm. your cloud of preference. I don't care which one. It's going to cost you about maybe a thousand dollars. I can guarantee you to spend a lot more during this uh, outage. (laughs) Yeah, indeed. But then again, who needs testing, right? Moving on. (laughs) Um, Yeah, then also we've already fixed the incorrect setting. That's the thing I talked about, about the thing that changed in 2018. So yeah, I hope they, they also documented it now. So that's good. Next point, which is one I also want to talk a little bit about, is we'll split up our single Cassandra cluster into smaller ones to reduce the impact change can have. Which, on the face of it, and I think we have a little bit of a, of a disagreement here, uh, Dave and me, on the face of it, mm. it seems like a good good decision. Let's mitigate the risk by just making smaller clusters. And I recognize that, because on my own little home IT department here, I've got too, way too much CPUs running than I should have. My wife likes me. <laughs> uh, I also have a containerized environment for that for a specific reason. I've got a mail server, got a gateway, got a DNS, I got everything and anything, which I think is funny, running somewhere without really understanding what every one of those things do and how they will possibly interact with each other. So I just containerize them, wasting resources well, a little bit. Docker containers are okay, but still I'm wasting resources because I'm too ignorant to understand how all the things work in detail together. Again, this is just my little hobby project, right? This is not what I do for a living. And when I read them, then deciding to split the Cassandra cluster smaller ones to reduce impact one change may have, it sounds good on, on, the, on the surface of it, but it also makes me think they are still admitting that they don't understand what they're doing well enough to risk it all in one cluster. And there are plenty of reasons to cut a cluster up in different pieces. I mean, that's not per se wrong. If you're having scaling yeah, sure. issues, I mean, every solution mm. except the good ones have scaling boundaries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to do any political, uh, religious, religious wars here. Um, you can have very important customers and less important customers. You have the expensive clouds and not expensive. There are reasons to do this. But doing it for the reason that... I'm kind of sure it's going to fail quickly. So I want to make sure if it fails, it doesn't bring everything down. Ah, that kind of hurts me. I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, while I don't, I don't strongly disagree with what you've said. I do think that for me, it does make perhaps more sense. And I think it's, to me, it's just more about risk mitigation and about reducing the risk that you're exposing yourself to. I don't think it's giving up or admitting that you don't know 
you don't know what you're doing. I think it's more of a case of, you know, protecting themselves at least to some extent from the unknown. And I, I, it's not necessarily the the number one best reason to go and split something up, but I do think it is it is a reason, and that they are acknowledging, you know, the things that it will do if one environment does go down. It does mean that uh, not all of their other services will be impacted, and I think that's I think that's reasonable and sensible. So. I'm not quite so so militant on that, but uh, they're creating silos, even their compute silos, not data silos, and that's kind of I don't know. It goes against my data lake. But, mindset. but they're already, <laughs> but they are already completely separate key spaces. It's not like they uh, are directly interacting like that. So it's fine. Mm. Let it go. Yeah. And go, again, this is go. not criticism on what they're doing. They know their solution best. They know what they need. And again. Many thanks to Chris Evans for writing, doing this write-up and being so open about the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I would very much join the replies on this uh, article because uh, kudos. Like it. Yeah, very much so. And it does actually mention that uh, Cloudflare are another organization that does uh, good write up So I might go and hunt out some of those and see what they have to say there. Mm. So on that note, anything else from you? Um, nope. You've done your YouTube spiel. You're not allowed to do it twice. <laughs> Okay. In that case, that is all the time we have for today. You can support this podcast by becoming a Patreon. Every contribution helps. We're on YouTube. Like, subscribe, notification bell, all the YouTube stuff. Journey to 100, remember? Please go to www.roaringelephant.org for a link to our Patreon page and for more information about this podcast. You can follow us on Twitter using the at Hadoopcast tag and send your feedback to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Until then, my name is Dave. And my name is John. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you then. Bye.